Hello, and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, Episode 5, Back to School. I'm Sean, here in Hamilton, and here with me live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions, and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone hanging out in the lobby here on Twitch. It's a pleasure to see people interested. For those listening later on, you can join us every Thursday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Audience feedback. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we hope to highlight some of that feedback, positive or negative. Short and sweet, Eric Farmer writes, I really enjoyed episode three. Hey, that's good enough for me. Over on our brother podcast, The Misdirected Mark, it was fun to hear Phil praise our name. He spent quite a bit of time on their last show talking about how Tabletop Bellhop just rolls off the tongue. It's a thanks, big, Phil. A big thanks to Misdirected Mark for continuing to spread the word about our show. Andrew D. writes in regards to episode four. I think you're really starting to hit your stride. Felt like you had the format just that much better more down, and you still managed to cover a lot of good material. Well, thanks, Andrew. We'll hear from Andrew again when we get to the Ask the Bellhop part of the show, but I feel we, we tightened up our editing a little bit in the last episode, and I think, uh, I think we, we came out with a, a great, solid hour of real content. So, awesome. at SteveD12 on Twitter writes, I listened to episode four and wanted to chime in about the term deck builder to describe games. We've talked about that on a few episodes now. Yeah. Some people are calling uh, Lord of the Rings Living Card Game a deck construction game versus Star Realms as a deck builder. So they, the difference is you construct a deck before the game instead of build it as you play. I, I like it. Deck construction versus deck building. At least it's two different terms, though they still construction building kind of the same thing, but at least there is a differentiation. Maybe we'll try to stick to those terms in the future to stop uh, having any confusion. Yeah, so as we're long, discussing. Be as long as we stick with a term, it works. I think there. I, I don't really see that that you know how construction says one thing over the other. But as long as we decide that construction means before, I think we're good to go. Yeah. That's not bad. We were talking about this before the show started earlier, and I did have an idea, and now I completely forget what it was. Deck, deck. Deck improvement. There. Right. Sorry. Mental block. Deck improvement games, I was thinking, for the build the deck while you're playing. Because you start with a pre-constructed deck. Usually everyone has the same deck. And as you're playing, you improve that deck by either adding cards to it or removing cards from it to make it more streamlined. So I'm thinking instead of deck building, we start calling those deck improvement games. I don't know if it'll catch on. It's a little not quite as fancy a term as deck building, but it fits what you're doing a little better. It makes a lot of sense. Now, we get better with your comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback back to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhop's tabletop? Every week, I like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. It's also a weekly feature at tabletopbellhop.com where I post our week in review as part of What Did You Play Mondays. As for the last week, it was pretty slow gaming-wise. Now, I don't know if that's because we had the big launch party and played a ton of games, which I'm sure you all heard about on our last episode, or it just there was, there was lots going on. We were a little busier. Now, I did mention last week we played The Colonists, and I noted at that time that I'd talk about more this week. Well, here we are, it's this week. So we played the first game two Mondays ago. Uh, it was me, my wife, and my friend, Sean. Again, the other Sean, the Windsor Sean. The Sean Hamilton from Windsor, which confuses everyone. Uh, we played through Arrow 1. It was a learning game. It was solid, uh, it was a good game. We made a lot of mistakes. We learned a lot from those mistakes. Uh, one of the amusing things is there's like an intro game. Actually, it's one of the worst intro games I've ever seen in a game because all it is is you set up the board and you move the pieces around and do what it says on these sheets of paper. You never actually play or make any decisions yourself. 
Like I would call that like a walkthrough or something, not an intro game. Even weirder is at the end, it goes once you played through the intro game a couple times. So I'm like, why would you do that? Like it's, you're just going to follow along. But anyway, in the intro game, they score way more points than we did just trying on our own. So I, fe I felt there was a lot to learn from the game. So we got together later in the week and we started over. We did era one again. And, but this time we didn't stop at era one. We decided to do era one and two. It was cool because it played very different. But man, when you start this game, you have a little two markets and a bunch of hexes around them, and you move your pawn, your worker to the spot tonight. When you land on them, it's pretty simple. All you do is you land on a spot, you do the action on it, you move your guy again, you do that three times, doing three actions every round. The actions are generally collect resources or turn those resources into better resources or spend those resources to build something on your board. Most of the things you build on your board are either houses for workers or buildings for them to work at. And that's pretty much it. There's not a lot there. But every year you play through in an era, and I totally forget how many there are. There's five or seven years in an era. Whatever it is, at the end of each one, you add more tiles to your map, your market. And then you get into the next, you, you play a summer phase and winter phase and you add more. And then you play a summer and a winter and you add more and you keep adding more and the, the board grows. So with that, every time your decision tree grows, like there's more branches, there's more places to go and more things you can do. And the newer tiles, of course, do different things than the ones that were there. And now by playing era one and two, we saw that the era two cards some of them are improvements on the era ones, so they're just better versions of the same type of spots, but others are completely new things. And what this leads to, though, is a ton of AP. Now, by AP, I mean analysis paralysis, when you people are spending a long time trying to decide what to do on their turn. Like, this was the, the decision tree of, oh, my God, like, there's so many options. And this is the first game I can remember playing where I really didn't mind that the other players are picking up their phones when it's not their turn because it could take a while. So we played through era one and two and we enjoyed it and we scored era two and I won. Uh, I had the most, one of the main things you get points for is you have your farms, so you have your guys and having them employed in buildings. Well, I had all, my entire board was filled, so I had tons of farmers and most of them were employed. And then I had a special card that gave me extra points for my unemployed guys. It was a social insurance card. So I did pretty good. So then we're like, eh, let's see, you know what? Let's leave it up. And we tried to play again. So we got together a third time and this time instead of starting over, we just played era three. So one of the things that was interesting here is had I known we were going to play into era three, I wouldn't have done, like I said, and filled my entire board because now it was difficult for me to get any points in era three because my board was already filled. But anyway, era three was actually the best of the three eras we played. It was a lot of fun. Uh, it, it was engaging. It was interesting. And actually, I just said it was a lot of fun. Fun's not the right word. This is not a fun. Ha, ha, ha. It's a great game. This is, they call it, like, right on the box, it says the epic strategy game. They're not kidding here. Like, this this is a lot of work, actually. A lot of what you're, you've described and the way I've seen about this game, it talks about, you know, a very a simple, basic rule set that just out through combinatorics turns into a massively complex game. And you don't need yeah. a complex set of rules to get a complex games. And I think some of the better games work off that premise where you you start with something simple and mm -hmm. the play in, expands and makes things complex without the rules doing it for you. Yeah, makes perfect sense. So this is a, this is a, a cool game. I, I do recommend it, but it's it's epic. Like we played three different nights, and these were full game nights. Like these were three four hour sessions, and we played through era one, two, and three. Well, there's four eras in the game. So like playing a full game, you're looking at like twelve hours. That's kind of nuts. I, I suggest doing what we did and break it up. What's kind of cool though is the game has an option where you can start any era you want. So you could decide we're going to play era two and three, or we're just going to play three and four or we're going to go one through three. The other thing it has, which I wish more games do, is it had a save game feature where there was a way to clean up the game, note down a couple things, and then be able to come back later. Now, you can only do it at the end of an era, but say we finished era two, instead of leaving it set up in my basement, we could have saved the game. I thought that was very neat. Well, if they know that it's a long, it's a long game, it, it's smart to put in uh, mechanics for that. Yeah, true enough. So next in my list is Can't Stop. 
Now, this is a classic push your luck game. I don't, you know, I've never seen anyone play it in Windsor, but I know it's really popular at public events. It's this big uh, stop sign, stop sign shaped board in red. It looks like a big stop sign and it's got little cones on it. And to be honest, I never knew how to play. It's really simple. You roll two dice and you move your your pawns up. The numbers you rolled or the numbers you rolled added together. And if, I don't know, I'm not going to explain the full rules. But it, it's a push your luck dice game. Really simple, really basic. Now, I don't really want to talk that much about Can't Stop. What I want to talk about is how and where I played it. So this started with a tweet from at game time, T-Y-M-E. Uh, cool cat named Eric Franklin. Played a lot of Destiny on PlayStation Network with him. Uh, it was about him playing a game of seasons, a uh, really beautiful dice based, uh, engine building game. And I commented that, oh man, I need to play seasons again. It's probably been a year and a half. And he replied, come play with me. Well, this guy doesn't, he's not local. He, I think he lives in Seattle. Sorry if I get that wrong, Eric, not here. That's the important part. And I'm like, what? And he's like, well, I just played on board game arena. Come play with me. And I'm like, wait, board game arena. I've heard of that. I, 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 okay, I'd never really looked into it, so I did. Uh, Eric's prompting. I went to boardgamearena.com, all one word, boardgamearena, created an account. And when you do that, the first thing it does is make you play a game of Can't Stop. So that's why I played Can't Stop. So Board Game Arena is pretty cool. It's web-based. I uh, use it in any browser. It's free-ish. It's free at first. It appears to be free. Um, it... The interface looks a little dated and a little messy, but it seems to work. You're much more polite me, about that than I am. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I, what I was impressed is any game I played looked like the game. So, for example, Sean played a game of Race for the Galaxy at one point, and the cards looked just like the cards from the game. Now, the little mouse over with the text showing up wasn't the prettiest, but the cards look like the cards. And I looked at a couple other games like the Carcassonne tiles look like Carcassonne tiles. So as far as the game being presented, I was impressed. And what I liked is you couldn't cheat. So like I played on, I think it was Yukata a long time ago. And then there's tabletop, the one on steam where all it really gives you is a place to play. And, but it doesn't monitor. So you could make illegal moves or move pieces. And actually on the steam one, you can flip the table, which I guess people get a kick out of. The other thing I was impressed by is the amount of games. Like there, there's a ton of games there. What I didn't know when I first wrote the blog post about this, and I only learned yesterday, was they're not all free. So I went to set up a game of Carcassonne to show off Board Game Arena Deshaun, and it's like, oh, you must become a premium member. So not quite as cool as I first thought. Now I will admit, I think it was under three dollars Canadian a month, which really that's not a bad price. So. Yeah, I, I think the the pricing was reasonable. I think it was a little underhanded the way they presented it because they didn't yeah. at any time during your onboarding session uh, indicate that it was a freemium or a, you know pay to play system. Mm -hmm. I learned it by the first thing I do when I go into any website is jumping in jump into the options and settings. And the first setting you present with you're presented with is you can choose your favorite color for board game pieces. Uh, and oh, that's that's a that. premium that's a premium only uh, feature. So the first thing I tried in settings bumped me into this. Hey, if you want to have a blue piece every time you play, you need to pay us. Um, oh wow! And then I went from that to finding uh, a couple of other features here and there, uh, and then uh, the and then the board games popped up. The other thing I was noticing is in the global chat on the side, some things were popping up on that global chat that said, "Sorry, this is for." premium members only. So I don't know if you can huh. shout out game requests in the global chat and and those and because I wasn't a member I can't see right. those particular. Um and then the, the next uh the next part was yeah, for me the interface, the games absolutely, I think you're right. The games looked a lot like the games. The interface itself and I think you said it best the other day, it looks like someone who graduated Visual, Visual Basic program up to a website. Uh, yes. And it felt it. Uh, and uh, Angie Games is, is pointing out that, yes, I'm sure they're paying licensing fees for these games. They would have been yes. struck down by lightning and all the courts <laughs> in the world if they'd been running this and not paying some games. So I understand they need yes. to pay. And, and again, they're reasonable rates. 
It was more the manner in which they disguised the fact yeah. that they were there at all that I took offense to. Yeah, like, to be honest, I was raving about this thing for about a week until yesterday, where I'm like, "Whoa, wait a minute! Wait, where'd this come from? What do you yeah. What do you mean premium? I I didn't say anything about premium, and then I kind of had to dig to even figure out how to log in as premium, and then passed on it for now. Now you know yeah. what? Three bucks a month, maybe it's something I'll do in the future. Yeah, and I mean, three I bucks will a note month. that. If I, if for you and I, for you and I to play, you know, Carcassonne and Seven Wonders, and you know, some of these games, nope. no Seven Wonders, yeah, you got to pay to play yeah. Seven Wonders. But but you know, yeah. there there are games on there that you know, we once we paid, we could we could play together, and and because we rarely get uh, the the four hours closer to each other that we uh, yes. we are, it's a good way to do it. And again, those games, the games looked great, so. All right. <laughs> Get we kind of went off our, yeah. our planned topic there. So here's some outtakes for you. I don't know if you're going to read that next part or just talk about that next part. I, or are we jumping down? I kind of already talked about uh, that. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> this is why you watch live. So after talking about my experience on Board Game Arena on social media, we got a quite, uh, wow, I can't type either. You can tell I have show notes. If you're a patron, you can see these. We have quite a few comments. <laughs> this is one we thought was worth sharing. So Tom Stern says, BGA is great. That's Board Game Arena. I've gotten some friends to join as well as made new friends. Great selection of games as they keep adding to. Yukata.de that Mo mentioned is also very good with a different selection of games. Mystic Veil vale right now is my favorite pl game to play online. Yeah, Yukata is one I remember a long time ago, back when it first came out. I was not impressed. Like I remember, I think I played Tigris and Euphrates because it was like the number one game on Board Game Geek. That's how long ago it was. It was rough. Like there was chat, but nothing made sure you were playing legally. It was just like a web based tabletop. I never went back. So, as Tom noted, it sounds like it might be worth checking out again. From what I hear, it's also completely free. So back to the rest of the week. Saturday was game day at the FLGS. Due to a family medical emergency, don't worry, everyone's all good now, I was only able to stop in for a short time. I was happy to see lots of games going on. There was a weird, cool mini or not game with marbles that looked like a gumball machine, and like they take marbles off the bottom and they slid down. That looked really neat. Uh, someone was playing Orléans, which is one of my favorite games of all time. Fantastic bag builder. There were a couple tables of... Uh, I, wanna, I almost said kids, younger people playing card games together. Uh, looked like the Exploding Kittens or something like that. I didn't check, but large player count games. There was a group painting Age of Sigmar minis. And what caught my eye right away was a table finishing up a game of Great Western Trail. Now, I have heard of Great Western Trail a long time ago, back when Terraforming Mars came out. And it was by Stronghold, and Great Western Trail was by Stronghold. And I think they're both up for an Origins Award. But even if they weren't for that, a lot of people were like, oh, Terraforming Mars is going to be Game of the Year. And I'm like, no, it's going to be Great Western Trail. So I sat, watched the end of the game. Chad, who was teaching the game, invited me to join in the second one. Now, I explained to him, I'm like, uh, people are at the hospital. I'm just waiting for a call. We're waiting for results. And if I get the results, I got to go. And he's like, no, no, cool. Sit down. Just play. We'll play as long as we can. And if it you have to go, you have to go. So really, thanks, Chad, for that. Uh, we sat down and played through. Uh, we got about probably about halfway through, which gave me a really good feel for the game. And I got to say, it's it's very solid. Like, remembering that hype, I can kind of see why people were like, no, no, it's better than Terraforming Mars, and other people are arguing back and forth. Now, I got to say, they're very, very different games. Like, like, they're not even close. And, like, really, to compare them, they're both good games. They're totally different, but good games. What I liked about it is it reminded me of uh, Kalos. Now, that's one of the first ever worker placement games. And in Kalos, it's um, you build the board, and there's like a path that goes down, and you activate all the buildings on the board. Well, this also had a path going the opposite way up the board, representing like the Old West. And on it was about five spots, and it's a branching path, like you could go different routes. And as you go up the board, you stop at these and you get like, I think it's four movement points and you count how many spaces you want to go. And the one you stop on, you activate. 
now one of those spots lets you build more buildings and then that fills up more spots on the track. So one of the things that's neat is as you're playing the route, the Great Western Trail evolves, more shops open up, more towns open up, right? Like I found it uniquely thematic that like this route game like kind of recreated the fact that as people move cattle out west these towns would pop up and railroads would get built and everything else i'm like oh that's pretty cool so as you're going through the route you collect cattle and at the end you sell them now they have to be different cattle and there's some set collection rules and all that whatever doesn't matter you go you trade in your cattle you get money and then you start at the back start of the road so it's just like a big loop where you just keep running the road and it's kind of up to you how quick you go so you might want to rush through and sell your cattle really quick and do the route multiple times. Or maybe you want to go slow and stop at all the different places. And then every time you go through, the route changes, right? Because people are building more buildings. So just like the colonists, though not much smaller in scale, the complexity goes up as you start. Like when you first start, all you need to know is what these five spots do. And then someone builds a new building. It's okay. I need to know these five spots and one more. And then the next time I need to know these five spots and these two more buildings. I really liked it. Now, there was a bunch of other little things going on. Like you could hire workers, you could hire engineers, you could build a train route, you could um, put guys in train stations. There were hazards you had to take care of, whatever. Like it, I'm not going to get into a full detail. Maybe I'll do a full review at some point. But like I only played for part of it and I got to buy a copy of this. Like that was a really good partial play of a game. So I actually did some research on this one because I was interested when I started uh, started seeing your uh, seeing it pop up in the show notes. Um, I heard some really great things about this game. Uh, my source for reviews tends to be Ars Technica because I'm a geek and it's a computer it's a computer site that does board game yeah. reviews. Um, and the the words I kept seeing over and over on this game were point salad and really complex mechanics like the complete Ooh. opposite of colonists where there were just so many different mechanics involved mm. in the game um and it ended up and then it ended up as a point salad game as a result um so when you saw about half the game uh how do you feel you got um you know how do, how do you feel you got in, involved in, and got a feel for it i it, well, I, I have an unfair advantage here. If I played thousands of games, I didn't find it overly complicated. I would not call it a heavy game. Now, if Ars Technica is trying to compare it to Catan, yes, it's heavy complex. But, well, here, this is a good example because you played it. It's simpler than Wasteland Express Delivery Service. Well, but Wasteland, is just, uh, Wasteland, Wasteland is another one where there's a lot of mechanics. So, I mean... exactly. You know, if, if, if it's so, in that, if you're comparing it to Wasteland, then it probably has a lot of mechanics in it. <laughs> yeah, that's, well, there's a lot of little things going on. So you're trying to do set collection, you're trying to collect engineers, you're trying to build your buildings, you're also trying to improve your trains, and as part of improving your trains, you're trying to get into stations. Uh, there was some other thing, when you complete a route, you could mark that uh, you owned a town or something. I don't know what it was thematically, but, you, and then as you do these things, you're removing stuff off your board, which gave you more options. So yeah, yeah. It's like, the more I think about it, the more like if one of the reasons I skipped over talking about workers, trains, hazards is because of that complexity. So yeah, I would say if you're a, a hobby gamer who plays a lot of hobby games, it's wouldn't be too hard to learn. Like it's, it's no Indonesia. It's no, 18xx like heavy no twilight imperium no fantasy flight 230 page rule book games but like it's it's up there it's higher than terraforming mars i'd much rather teach terraforming mars i didn't oh, yeah. teach this so right. i couldn't like shad's the one that taught it and again most of it was like what, uh, what a lot of us board gamers do who know that we know each other's games is like oh you use this mechanic like this like he said oh it's like building buildings in calis and i'm like oh i get that you're gonna put more stuff on the road and he's like oh to get rid of hazards you do this and i'm like yeah hey, okay i've seen that in this other game so yeah it's it's definitely on the heavier heavier side right okay good to know We record the show live Thursday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby, thanks to our moderator, Anshi Games. We're uh, filling up in here tonight. We've got uh, Brian, as always. Uh, our Zades uh, joined us a little late, but we started a little late, so that's okay. Uh, and <laughs> then didn't miss uh, much. And Will Chamberlain uh, just popped in. So, welcome to all of you. Do we have any questions so far? Comments? 
Uh, mostly for Manchi Games, just uh, helping out our aides who jumped in late and uh, dis- deciding that heavy medium should be a thing. So heavy medium yeah. games. I could see that. That fits. Thank you all for joining us. You can find us all across the web now, and we grow by the support of listeners and viewers like you. So please take a minute to subscribe to our content on your favorite platform, give us a like, thumbs up, or review where you find us, and help us spread our gaming advice to the world. If seeing us live on Twitch isn't enough, you can find Sean and I live and in person at Queen City Conquest. That runs September 7th to 9th. It's a smaller local con in Buffalo, New York. This will be our first official con of her. Uh, con appearance another cool one that we set up just yesterday is we've made a deal with our brother podcast the misdirected mark i mentioned earlier to host each other's twitch channels so if anyone out there is watching us on the misdirected mark channel right now welcome thanks for joining in and same thing if you turn into the tabletop bellhop on tuesday nights at 8 30 eastern 9 30 the queen's time or is it 10 30 the queen's time They'd shoot me for not knowing this. Um, You can watch them live on our show. Which, as you know, goes live every Thursday, 9.30 Eastern, at twitch.tv.tabletopbellhop. Slash Tabletop Bellhop. If you have a tabletop gaming Twitch channel and are interested in a similar arrangement, please contact the Bellhop at mo at tabletopbellhop.com. So I was up late last night, really late, working on something new. We now have a newsletter. I'm really happy with the way it turned out. You can now sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop weekly in your inbox. Every Wednesday, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we released in the past week. So blog posts, new podcast episodes, and anything else we're working on. Like we're currently trying to record a video of me building a Gloomhaven insert. That'll be on there. And I got to say, I took a look at it today, and it looks nice. It's clean. It's not spammy. And it's also not just that block of ASCII texts that some people send out. It's a nice-looking way to present a quick summary of what's happened in the past week. Thank you. You can sign up at www.subscriberpage.com slash tabletopbellhop, or go over to tabletopbellhop.com and check the sidebar where there's a spot you can sign up. And I really should have read that at... Web address <laughs> once before I tried saying it yeah, while I read it. Wow. So it's subscriber page, one word, dot com, www.subscriberpage.com forward slash tabletop. So, so it's actually www.subscriberpage.com? Yeah. Ah, uh, so dot. we're missing a dot. There we go. That's why. Okay. I'll put that in there for next time. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> I just added that, like, while well, I, I sent out the notification that it was live this morning. We can sign up for a vanity URL, but we have to register it with GoDaddy first. Right. And then once we have it, we can link it. And I'm like, I don't know. how is it worth it or not? It's, it's a P-I-T-A to do that. So Yeah. Uh, <laughs> All right. I got to ask again. This is something that will probably get cut. How are we doing on time? Because I don't know when we started because of everything being... Uh, the timer says 23 minutes, but I started it a little bit late. So we're probably getting close to half an hour. Oh, that's not bad. All no, because right. we've got a bunch of extra stuff I can trim out already like this. <laughs> yes. Each episode, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or you can head over to the webpage, tabletopbellhop.com, and click on Ask the Bellhop. We need your questions. We're here to help, but we don't know what kind of help you need. What is the best insert I can buy for Gloomhaven? Um, What are some great cell phone apps that recreate board games? What is the best random dice roller on the net? Ask away. Tonight, Andrew D. from Mr. Esdied Mart's Slack Room for Life asks, How do you approach getting heavier games to the table in terms of teaching people how to play? Get them to watch a how to play video, do the first playthrough, do a big dump of info, or something else. Now, this is a great question and one I think everyone struggles with, particularly when introducing new games to new gamers to games, like we discussed in episode four. So, this is going to be a longer one. So, you know, sit back, get a comfy chair. Teaching is a skill, 
like any skill, has to be learned and it can be improved on with practice. Teaching games is no different from teaching anything else. It's something you'll get better with over time and something that you'll get better the more you do it. I've done a lot of teaching. I'm the game teacher in our group. I couldn't count the number of games I've taught over the years. It's infrequent that I attend a game night and I'm not actually teaching something new to someone. I've even done it professionally, doing demo games at the local game store. And again, practice, practice, practice. It's not something that comes easy. Um, or even if the, the flow of words, even if you are a good public speaker, teaching isn't the same as public speaking. And it's a different skill that needs to be practiced, practiced, practiced. Now, the best thing I've found that will improve your ability to teach is knowing a bit about how people learn and then using that knowledge of how people learn so that you teach better. So now this is really in general, and I'm no psychologist, but like these are things that have, have been researched. I, I, I'm not going to footnote and give you my notes. This is based on personal experience and things I've read and watching other people teach. So the four main ways people tend to learn are reading things, hearing things, watching things, and doing things. Now, everyone's different. Everyone does learns these at different levels. Like everyone's going to learn from all of those things, but like some person may learn way better by reading it themselves. Other people, you hand them a rule book and they're just going to glaze over and reading it's doing nothing. They don't retain any of it. They're just flipping pages. They want to hear it. They, they, they're the people who listen to audio books versus reading books. Other people have to watch it. Now, doing it is something that in general seems to be the best way to learn for everyone in general, but everyone is different. So of those four things, we're going to break it down and we're going to talk about each of them. So again, reading, hearing, watching, and doing. So reading. If you have a player that learns best by reading, do them a favor. Let them read. Like if you, one of the best things you can do is send them a PDF of the rule book before the game night or lend it to them. The other thing is if they really love reading, maybe they're the one that should teach the game instead of you. Just because you own the game doesn't mean you necessarily have to be the one that teaches it. If you've got a friend that loves doing that, let them do it. Now, I realize that's not always going to work and not everyone wants to do before the game night homework. So the other thing you can do for the reader in your group is have stuff there at the game night for them to read. So give them handouts, prepare handouts, give them player cards, reference sheets. So here's a plug for a, a fantastic website called the Esoteric Order of Gamers. I probably should have got the web address, but if you Google that, there's only one. This is a site that produces professional quality rule summary sheets. Like I used to run and hopefully will run again, a local tournament called the Great Canadian Board Game Blitz. And one of my tricks for running that tournament is to go and get the esoteric order of gamers sheets for all the games that are gonna be in it and toss them in the box. Cause even if you think you know the game rules, you can like, it summarizes them. It gives them in a, in a logical order and it's easy to read. So what you're gonna do with your reader is give them this stuff and they can read while you're talking and while you're teaching. They can look and look ahead and they can read along, basically. And so that's uh, www.orderofgamers.com. There we go. Uh, thank you, Uh And so one of the other things you need to really be careful with as we're getting into these, these different ways of, of learning is making sure you figure out what people are. Um, if you've got your own regular group, it becomes easier. You'll know people better and you'll know that, oh, player A is a reader, player B is a listener, player C only ever gets it once we sit down and start playing the game. And that's great. So what you really need to develop is ways of picking up on little things like that when you're out at the FLGS or at a, you know, board, you know, at a convention. Um, the, the real skill, and again, it's picked up I get through practice, 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 is that being quick on picking up how someone learns and that's, and once you, once you've developed that, then you can put into practice all the different methods like Mo's going through here. Yeah, exactly. So hearing what all our podcast listeners are doing right now, uh, verbally explaining things as we've proven time and time again on this podcast and my 
verbal blunders is the hardest part. You're not going to be good at it. It takes practice. I'm sure we're not that old a podcast, but if you listen to me on episode one and listen to me now, I hope I sound better than I did. One secret, though. Don't just read the rules out loud. Like, like no one learns good that way. Don't grab the rule book. And I, yes, I noted I've done this before. Try to be ready ahead of time. Practice ahead of time. Like, here's this is all the same stuff for public speaking, right? The whole record yourself. Talk to yourself in a mirror. Like, yeah, I know it sounds silly to do it for board games, but especially if you run like a gaming club or you're running demo events or you're at the FLGS, it's going to make a difference. Not only that, even if it's just your own personal group you game with all the time and you're the teacher, it's going to make your game night flow and start better if people understand the rules better. Like, I, I think it's worth the effort. So another thing is to make sure you can be heard. Uh, projection, make sure you're not in a noisy space. If you are, try to find a way to direct your voice. Again, it's like actually taking a, a course on voice techniques is not like totally unheard of. You are presenting to the public, even if the public is only the three other gamers at the table. You also have to make sure you can be understood. So you don't want to rush. This is something I personally struggle with, especially on this podcast. I like to talk quick, especially if I'm excited about something. I get faster and faster. And I realize that some people out there listen at two times speed and I sound worse than a chipmunk. Slow down. Take your time. Don't rush. Get the rules across. You want to repeat the important parts. So how to win the game is a really important one. Like I personally have sat there when someone's teaching the rules and they go on and on about the theme and then they go on and on about how to move the pieces and on and on about how to handle all these cards in your hand. And then they're like, okay, let's play. And I'm like, whoa, wait, what, what do I do with all this? Like, like so you kind of, it's not only do you want to explain how to win, but like repeat it. So say I'm teaching Catan. I'm going to know that you are trying, it's a race. A lot of people don't realize Catan's a race game. Catan is a race game. You are racing to 10 points. First person to hit 10 wins. And I'm going to sit there and explain that during the game, you're going to build roads, which lets you build settlements. You want to build settlements because they're worth points. And remember, the first person to 10 points wins. And then I'm going to go on and explain more of the rules. And I'll be like, later on, when you have two stone, or not stone, two ore and three wheat, you can upgrade that settlement to a city. So that does cool stuff. Like you get new resources, like you get double what you used to, but it's also worth two points. And remember, it's a race to 10 points. So you're going to note that. So that by the time people are playing, they're like, oh yeah, Catan, I got to get to 10 points as quick as I can. You're also going to repeat the easily forgotten rules. So this is the stuff, you know, people mess up. So I have now learned having played great, uh, not great Western Trail, Wasteland Express delivery service with Sean to fully explain the difference between a quest delivery and a normal supply delivery. So the next time I start teaching that game, I'm going to fully pull out a card and show people the difference between the two. So, and again, you want to repeat it. So if I was teaching Wasteland Express now, I'd be like, look, I'm delivering this. They have a token that shows they want this. I'm not fulfilling a quest. I'm delivering the good here. And then I'm going to show a different one where I'm filling in the quest. So the other thing, now this is another, kind of goes to how people teach. You want to present three things every time you're presenting a rule where possible. Now it's not, sometimes this is self-evident, but you want to explain what, how, and why. Now this comes from my work experience. I write standard operating procedures. I write work instructions. And in them, you always want to have these three things. So you want what? What are you doing? Let's say it's Catan. I'm building a road. There's my what? How? How do I build a road? Well, I trade in a wood and I trade in a brick. I give those to the market. I take one of my wood tiles. I put it on the board. Then you want to explain why. Why do you want to build roads? Well, you can only build new settlements unless there's two roads between them and you want to build settlements. Why? To get those victory points. So the why helps with retention. It lets people know why these complex mechanics exist. So if you hand Great Western Trail, I get a hand of cards. Why are the cards all different colors? So you tell people you're going to grab cards, you're going to trade them in. You're like, what? Oh, well, you get new cattle cards by drawing from the deck. How? That, so I've got what? Get new cattle cards. How? I draw from the deck. Why? Well, you can only turn in a set of cards if every card in your hand is different. If all the cards in your hand are the same, you want to try to cycle through that hand to get different cards so that when you turn them in at the end of the game, they're worth more points. So you want to always do what's the rule? How do you implement the rule? How do you do it? And then why? Why does it exist? So while you're talking, you're going to look for cubes. 
you're looking for nodding, leaning in, people asking questions. That's all engaging. That's good. That's people are are engaging with you. They're paying attention. You see people leaning back, playing with the components, making a stack of dice, yawning. That's bad, you know, on their cell phone. You've obviously kind of lost the people. It's going to happen. Like if I try to explain a long, complicated game, keep going back to Wasteland Express, you got to watch it. it you're going to lose people here and there. So you got to mix it up. You got to engage the players. Now, more to get into how to do that when we get, uh, more about how to do that when we get to doing as opposed to hearing. And this is where, you know, back, piggybacking off what was just said, mechanics are important and there's no doubt. And you, the, the what, how, and why, you have to remember that even within that what, how, and why, the theme of the game really does matter. Um, Talking about Wasteland Ex Express, you could break it down into individual how, what, and why. The, you know, how do you how do you do this? You well, you get a, a victory point if you do this action off this card, and you do it so that you can get the action point. But to know that it's a game about the Outland and about Wasteland, and it's post-apocalyptic, will change how you think about things. And and what comes to me is when we played Big Trouble in Little China. You know, we knew the mechanic, we knew the setting. But we didn't actually think about the setting. And I think if we had focused more on the setting, we would have played that game very differently and we would have had a different outcome. Um, so make sure you, you think about that theme and that setting as part of the rules because they can really help with the interpretation of those rules. Yeah, I think we tried to D&D &D Big Trouble in Little China and kill all the monsters. Yep. And, and it, loot their failed. it failed miserably. Yes, yes it did. Moving on to watching. You don't just tell show, right? I'm sure everyone's heard that before. Don't tell people, show them. So while you're talking and they're listening, show. Like draw cards, move minis, flip tiles, roll dice. Go through the actual motions. Do the things you're talking about doing. Move money from the player area to the bank. In Great Western Trail, draw a hand of cards. Show them the cattle. Show them discarding cattle. When you get to the end, show them a complete set of three cards. Show what you get paid for it. If you're doing Catan, a really good one to show people in Catan is when they build a road and a settlement, how to cut someone off so they don't score longest road. Right? This is... One of the important things, like make sure you're not just talking, you're not just reading the rule book, you're actually showing people how to play the game and move through the motions. Now there's a next level to this. So here, here's where I teach everyone to level up their game teaching. Seed the game, prepare it so that you know what outcomes will be set and what dice will be rolled and show off the hardest parts of the games. So say I want to show off, I probably should have put an example in here that I can do off the top of my head. Um, so I'm not doing this off the top of my head, but you want to stack the deck. So I'm playing Star Realms, and I'm going to sit there and set up a market that shows at least two of the different factions so that I can show, uh, it's here, even better, two of the different factions, an attack card, a buy card, and an outpost, all there in the market for the first turn when I'm trying to teach the game so that I can show when I buy this card, it goes into my discard, but then when I draw this card, and it's the same faction as the next card. They combo and their bottom powers go off. Now, I'm not trying to teach Star Realms, but you get what I mean about seed the deck. Like, have it so that you can show off the perfect situation. So you're trying to teach Castles of Burgundy, a great Steffenfeld game, and it's you roll dice to do stuff. Well, don't roll the dice. Set them to the right sides to show off that difficult. Well, not that there's a lot of really difficult mechanics in that, but to show off the mechanics. So it's not just, hey, draw a hand of four cattle. Have that deck set up so that when you draw, there's two ones in that hand when you're playing Great Western Trail so that you can show, oh, you know what? You can't use both of those at once. They have to be all different cattle to trade them in. So that's that's an important, like, next level step. Like, not everyone does this. And the hard part is you can only do it if you're set up ahead of time at the FLGS or you're playing at home and you can set the game up ahead of time. Now, the main thing is don't just talk here. Like, don't be a robot. Don't just read the rules. Remember what I said about repeating things so they sink in? Don't just read the rules. Have it set up. Have the board set up. Show them as you explain. Then we go to the next step. Instead of you doing it, have them do it. And this is one thing where, and it, it's going to depend on your gamer, but I know for me, for instance, sometimes just getting in and playing that game can make the big difference. 
you can you can go over the rules and and under, and establish the basics and and the basis for the game. But some games and Wasteland Express is a, is a perfect example. You know, when you've got a lot of mechanics and you may not have uh, gamers who you know have played a thousand games before, sometimes it's better to say, "All right, well, why don't we just try this out? No harm, no foul. Let's get in there and play the game, and we'll see." where we're having problems or where we're having problems. And everyone goes in with no expectations. Now, there are some games that you don't want to do this. If you're playing The Colonists, you might not want to start a 12-hour game as a let's learn how to play. Maybe not the best choice. But, you know, everyone can jump in and play a game of Catan. And sure, the first time you play, you blow three mechanics and forget to check what every other player is doing and you're left in the dust. But you know that now. And the next time you play... Oh, well, if I don't do this and this, I'm going to get trounced, so I'll work on it. And then I know uh, people pointed out before, you know, when, when I got through Wasteland Challenge last time, I was excited to play it again. We didn't have the time that night, but uh, I was excited to play it again because I wanted to take what I had learned and turn that into a better game the next time. And so a lot of players, I think, are able to do that. Oh, that's excellent. So moving on to doing. So this is by far the most important one and the one I see most game teachers miss. The best way for almost every person to learn something is and retain it is by doing it. So you want people doing things right away. So one part of this is pretty simple. Get to the actual game as quick as possible. You probably don't have to teach every little rule before beginning play. Say there's random events that come up. You can explain what those do as they come up during the game. You don't have to sit there and tell everyone what every possible card is. If it's a deck builder, explain what those cards in the middle row are, the market, and note the different types of cards that can be expected, but you don't have to explain every type of card that comes up. You know what? And a deck builder is perfect. Someone buys a card, you put a new card up, you explain what that new card does. Same thing with almost any game with stuff that randomly shows up during the game, even with die rolls or like, look, when you you know what, we're not going to explain in Gloomhaven what happens when you open the door. When you open a door, I'll show you what happens, right? You want to get people playing. Now, here's, uh, again, the higher level thing is get players to do things while you're teaching. So this goes back to, to showing the game and them watching. Instead of showing and doing yourself, have the players do it. Like, instead of you drawing the cards, have them draw the cards. Have them roll the dice. Have a player move the miniatures. If you're trying to teach the war rules in... Rising Sun, set up the boards, give people each a pile of money and have them do a little quick auction to show how that war plays out. Have one of the other players move the armies on the board so that you can see it. Have people do things, have them actually touch and do stuff. It's important. Like it's going to sink in way more. I've seen a lot of teachers that just kind of sit there and kind of set up a solo game and play it themselves. And they're showing how to trade cards in Catan and they're holding two. They got two hands of cards on the table. They're passing them back and forth. Why not have the players holding those cards and go, hey, do you have any wood? Don't you need wood? Why don't you trade your wood for his sheep? Oh, do you now have enough to build a road? Let's see how to do that. Right. You want to engage the players having doing stuff. Now, there's one caveat. There is a type of gamer out there who wants to know everything and have perfect info before the game starts. If you have one of these in your group or one shows up at the FLGS game night, you may be forced to let them look at every tile to go through the entire encounter deck so they know what to expect. Personally, I would try really hard to push to this player, hey, look, we're just going to play a first game. It's a learning game. Points don't matter. We'll play this, and then we'll play a real game once you understand everything. But you will run into these people. So I'm telling you to jump to the game as quick as possible, but that may not always be possible. There are gamers out there who want they they want all the information ahead of time. These are the guys who are going to show up partway through and go, you didn't tell me that. Or if I'd known that, I wouldn't have done this. Or I, you know what I'm talking about. I think everyone's met those gamers before. There's a lot of different types of gamers out there. And again, experience and practice helps a lot with this. With alpha gamers, if you know them and if you know them, if you if you're if you're aware of them and you're expecting them, there are things you can do in advance. You can they're the ones you can pre-send PDFs to, send YouTube links to, warn them in advance what you're planning on bringing to the FLGS or what you're going to be playing at the uh, you know at your gaming night, so that they have the ability to get that information themselves, and that really. Uh, that really sort of puts the onus on them. If they want to be the ones who know everything, well, that's great. 
that's how they want to work, but they can't hold back the entire group. So when you do have someone like that, you need to make sure that, you know, maybe you give them the rule book and say, okay, you go over here while I help these guys understand the game because these people just need a little bit of help. So I'm going to have the cards and we're going to play through a round over here while you read the rule book and help grasp it a little bit better. Another tip, actually, if you're doing a local gaming event, you have a few of these guys, girls, get them together at the same table. They'll love it. They'll have the most competitive game ever they would never played before and take it all very seriously. Hey, to each their own. So something else I almost never see a rookie gamer do. Like, we've already done the top four, right? So now we're going to the extra tips. Check for understanding. Like, yeah, we called this uh, back to school. I'm not talking about give everyone a quiz. But... Ask players questions, leading questions. Like I kind of gave the example with the cards in your hand. Oh, do you happen to have uh, a wooden a brick in your hand? Oh, you do. Well, what do you remember? Do you remember what you can build with that? Right. You're you're just looking to make sure the players understand. So you want to see if they grok what you taught, right? So especially harder parts. So again, going back to Wasteland Express. Next time I teach that game, I would probably go, "Hey, you got a quest card." Does that quest card have a delivery on it? Do you remember that that's not, that's an outpost action as opposed to delivery action, right? Or do you remember what kind of action that would be, right? You're trying to make sure they, they get it. So that was a big info dump. I realize it's a lot. So we're going to try to pull it all together. So kind of summarize. The first thing you're going to do is learn the game yourself. We're not talking about that here. That's a whole other topic. We could probably do a whole episode on learning games beforehand learning to teach games is different we're going to assume at this point you figured out how to play whether it's watching rodney spith on a video it's sitting down with your lonely fun and reading the rule book or it's going to the local pub and hanging out with a bunch of guys who know the game and having to teach the rules whatever it is you learn the game then you prepare so as noted earlier there's prep to this like don't just show up pull the shrink wrap off the game Open it up and go, okay, let's play and try to figure out how to play this. That's really, it's a waste of your game night. Play something you know. Come back next week and play that shiny new game. I know you're excited to play it, but learn it first. So you're going to gonna get the game set up, if possible. You're going to have handouts printed ahead of time. Heck, laminate them. Go for it. There's the, the Phil Vecchio. We mentioned Phil earlier. We're bringing up laminating, Phil. This show's for you. Laminate your stuff. Make it look pretty. You're going to have rule summaries. Print stuff out in color. That great sheet you got from Esoteric Order of Gamers does no good sitting on your printer. Make sure it's in the box. Have your stuff ready. Check and see if there's an FAQ for the game. Have the rules changed since the printing came out. Sometimes board games are like video games. It's no Xbox where the first time you go to play it doesn't work, but they may have found issues with the rules since the game was released. Board Game Geek is fantastic for this. Go there, see if there's an FAQ. Read through, see what the common problems are. Sometimes you read an FAQ and go, well, yeah, that's right in the rule book, but obviously people miss it or it wouldn't be in the FAQ. Have everything there on hand. Now, we mentioned this earlier. If you want, send out copies to players ahead of time. I admit most gamers don't do homework, but some do. They probably won't read it, but you never know. Maybe you'll have one or two people show up who know the rules ahead of time. So another thing that I think is an important step to this, maybe I should have mentioned it earlier, is a preface to, to teaching the game. You want to explain your familiarity with the game. If it's your first time teaching, that's okay. Let the other players know. Say, hey, you know what? I just got this on the weekend. I've read the rules. I've watched a couple videos. Heck, I even set it up at home to look at everything. But I've never taught this before, so bear with me. It's, it's, you're not embarrassing by yourself by explaining your level of knowledge. If you go, you know what? I've taught this a hundred times here. I'll go through this quickly. Don't worry. It's not hard. Let them know. Note that it's a teaching game. Your first game you're playing of any game, don't worry about who wins or wins or loses or your points or your score. Explore the game. Try to learn the rules. Try the weird strategy that you're pretty sure won't work, but why not check it out? What you want to do is if there's time, anytime you're teaching a game, try to play twice. Like set it up once, do the teaching game, and then do a full game. And like this time we're playing for real. Now, this is another one that people seem to have a hard time with, and I don't see happen often, but should happen more often. It's okay to stop that first game early. Like play through the first two, three turns, and then go, okay, everyone got it. You got all the rules, you build stuff. Why don't we wipe the board or we'll reset? Let's play for real. Let's, let's go. Now everyone knows. Let's have a real competition. Let's see who wins. You don't see this happen. It's, it's the um, sunk cost fallacy. 
once you start playing, people believe that, well, I've already spent this much time. I might as well finish. It's the same reason you finish watching a bad movie or finish a book that's terrible. It's, it's one of those silly human things that we do that logically doesn't actually make any sense. There's no reason to finish that teaching game. Like, if you're all having fun, go for it. But if you really want that competition and play it for real, stop partway through. So at this point, you've given that speech, right? You're, you're saying, we're here to try to learn the rules. We're, it's a teaching game, so now you're going to teach. You're going to use the suggestions above. You're going to tell the players the rules. As you tell them, you're going to make sure you're showing them. And while showing them, make sure they're engaged by actually doing things themselves. It's the four things we talked about ahead. You're going to hand out the player reference materials ahead of time so that your readers can read along. And you're going to try to get to the game as quickly as possible. Now, Sean kind of mentioned this earlier. You want to get to know your group. You want to read them. You want to adapt. Does your group have a lot of readers? Maybe you set 10 to 15 minutes aside and say, hey, here's a handout. Why don't you guys sit, read through this through. I'm going to go get some coffee. Or why don't you read this while I set up the board and pre-stage some stuff? This is a good time to do that um, seating of the decks if you want to use that later to teach. Everyone gets to read, read through this reference sheet while I get things set up. So you're going to start up the game. You're going to teach as you go. You're going to play through a round or two. And as I mentioned, maybe you reset it. Maybe you keep playing. One so, thing. Oh, one thing I was. Last thing. <laughs> one thing I was saying when you, when it comes to setting up the game, while there there can be a real benefit to having them help you empty, help you place the pieces, help you yeah. shuffle the cards uh, in a big game. There's just something about letting your players feel and touch and look touch. at the pieces. Um, you know, there are people who are tactile learners and, and you know, holding things and, and, and looking at them with them in your hand can make a big difference to, uh, to a lot of people as well. And so don't underestimate the power of having people help you set up the game. It's not necessarily cheating. It's not just, you know, oh, I'm lazy. I don't want to set up my game. No, having everyone take part in setting up a game can help everyone understand some of those pieces that much better. Yeah, it makes sense. And actually, maybe we should have five things there with tactile. That reminds me of our last episode. Ryan, Ryan, Ryan with a P on Twitter, who was blind, who noted how box inserts actually make games more accessible. That's something again, being fully abled, I often forget. But yeah, tactile learners like hand people the parts, like, hey, feel this. This is this is a road. It's a long wooden stick. It kind of looks like a matchstick. This is a settlement. It's a small house. This is a city. It's a bigger house with a peak. This is uh, that's pretty much it for containing components. The board's hexes and so on. Oh, it makes sense. And plus, like, ex you can explain the thing as you hand it to them. These are a deck of cards that we're going to draw to have encounters. Can you shuffle those for me? Makes sense. So another note: learn from your mistakes. You'll make them. Remember, we've said it many times, and again, we're repeating the stuff we think is important. Remember that it's a skill, one you have to learn. You're going to get better. Now, a final tip on learning to teach, learn from others. Today, there are a ton of how to play videos out there. Watch those, that's what worked for me, learn from them. S excuse me, see what order they teach things in, how they engage with the rules, etc. All right. Well. Oh. Well, redo the bell in a second. And back in the lobby, we've had some great discussions in there talking about how people like to learn and different uh, personalities that they've met and they are in the game uh, at the gaming table. Uh, it, it really is a whole wide world of people out there who all learn differently, uh, just like everyone te who teaches teaches differently. And taking and practicing and learning about those people uh, through just experience is really the best way to do it. All right. Sounds good. And actually, Will Chamberlain, yes. <laughs> Will Chamberlain brings up an important point. If you forget an important rule, don't bring it up in the middle of the game and use it to win. In a matter of fact, don't bring it up in the middle of the My game. Secret. Don't even bring it up in the middle of the game. That's what extreme games are for. You've made a mistake, <laughs> you've made a mistake, own it, and live with it, and then when the game is done, you can use that as another teaching moment and explain, well, look, you know, this is what we did, we should have done this, it'll change the game a little bit, See what, think about what you would have done differently, and it's another teaching experience sometimes, even if you have just forgotten a rule. 
All right, we actually ready for the lobby check in, or was that the lobby check in? I think that was the lobby check in. Okay. Okay. (laughs) We're good. All right. So this was a great one of the things that I actually want to get better at. Like the live show, you guys get to see this, but like we try a little too hard to stick to what we're doing. We have outtakes for a reason. We are going to cut this down for the podcast. I think we need to interact and not must get this done and set time (laughs) and get it all right and not mess it up. So. All right. So this was a great talk, but if you'd like to read up on the topic, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com where the bellhop has covered this topic as well. Remember, if you've got a burning question, you can head over to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash tabletopbellhop, all one word, and support us at the good tip or better level, and your questions get bumped to the top of the list. Speaking of our Patreon, a shout out and thank you to our backers, Brian Kurtz, thank you very much. And Duran Barnett, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, And drop by TabletopBellHop.com where you can also find regular posts, including detailed answers to questions, game reviews, the Week in Review, and more. Also, stop by and check out our list of other gaming content providers. If you don't see your favorite site or favorite podcast, let me know. I'll be sure to add it. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at Patreon.com slash TabletopBellHop. Now, the Patreon's still a work in progress. We are looking to add more reward levels. What I'd love to know is what you guys would like to see us offer. Again, mo at tabletopbellhop.com. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Thursday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop live to hit your podcatchers at YouTube uh, and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on. Thank <laughs> you.